Hi, it's Dean Carnassus, author and ultra marathoner. You know, they looked at me and they said, but you're, you're not even a runner, you're, you're drunk. And I said, I am, but I'm still going to do it. But it's going to involve about uh, 5,000 miles. He was named one of the top 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine. He runs 300 miles non-stop. And the answer is, run faster. <laughs> My, uh, my whole uh, life is built around attending uh, live events, you know, and those kind of went away. Are you getting younger? You, 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 it looks like you get younger instead of older. <laughs> I think because I haven't been traveling as much, you know, I don't, I don't have the, those, that jet lag and fatigue of, uh, of you know, multi-day flights and travel. Yes. And we're here to talk about your wonderful career friends at home um i'm gonna i'm just gonna tell you how i got to know of dean and dean's probably um i have no doubt sick of hearing these stories but it it's it's more a, a lesson in in always believe in yourself and and always dream big um but let's just give dean's book a shout right from the start this is the dean's latest book a runner's high Absolutely thoroughly recommended, and we'll put a link below. But here's the thing: there was I. I was on. I think I just started my writing career about 2008. Might have been 2010. Um, and I got a Facebook message from my friend Jim, and he said, "Chris, check out this guy." And up until that point, Dean, I had, um, you know, I'd been in the Marines. So it was quite challenging stuff that you, you do in the British Marines. But the hardest thing I think that I ever did was run a marathon. And um, because I didn't let myself walk any of it, I managed to just get in under the, 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 the four hour uh, barrier. And um, as I say, I thought it was like the hardest thing I've ever done. And I genuinely believed if you ran one step more than a marathon, you, you just drop down dead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, this is, this is how it was back, you know, back, back then. And so I'm checking out the, this Facebook page that Jim sent me and it's your page, Dean. And there's this guy. He doesn't just like run a marathon. He runs 300 miles nonstop. Um, it, and I, I thought I want to do that. Okay. N not 300, although I did manage 200, probably not, not in the times that Dean, Dean would do it in, but I did, I ran 200 miles in six days and I ran the length of the country in 36 days. So a thousand miles, but I remember grab immediately, Dean, I grabbed a copy of your book. I read it. I loved it. And yeah, like I say, I thought I want to do that. And off the back of it, <laughs> now I've probably run, you know, I run, I literally run every day because I love it so much. Um, so thank you. Well, I mean, uh, I, I appreciate the thanks. And I, I think people read that book and they uh, do uh, one of two things. They just say, I'm never going to do anything like this. Or like you said, God, I want to try this. So I think my book just um, kind of opened people's eyes to, you know, what's possible. And uh, you certainly, um, you know, you drink the proverbial Kool-Aid, if you will. But um, it's, it's good to uh, have, you know, spend some footsteps alongside you. Yes. And there was one thing, if I remember rightly from your first book, it was a long time ago I read it, but were you not in a bar celebrating your <laughs> b birthday with your mates? And then you just said, screw this. I, I don't want it. My life's not going the way I want. And, and you just went running. Yeah. I mean, I was, yeah, I was uh, drunk uh, on my 30th birthday. And at midnight, I 
you know, I said, I'm leaving the pub. And they said, you know, where, where are you going? Like, the night's young. Let's have another round of tequila to celebrate. And I said, no, I'm going to I'm going to run 30 miles to celebrate instead. And, you know, they looked at me and they said, but you're, you're not even a runner. You're, you're drunk. And I said, I am, but I'm still going to do it. And I walked out of the bar and I'll never forget. I didn't even own running gear, but I had on these comfortable silk underwear, like these uh, silk boxer shorts. So I, I peeled off my pants and threw them down the alleyway and, and just started stumbling off uh, into the night, heading south, uh, knowing there was a town called Half Moon Bay that was 30 miles away. And that, that's where I set my sights upon Half Moon Bay. Was that the same night you ordered a pizza or was that a different? <laughs> it's a different night, but um, <laughs> food is always a major theme in the middle of the night, as, as any ultra runner knows. Yes, and that's a, a whole interesting thing. And I, I think all of us, as we're getting older, we're trying to refine our act, which is, I think it's good credit to our generation. Um, everyone seems to go more and more plant-based. Um, and I remember what I took from Ultra Marathon Man, again, folks, link, link below, is it was that just eat anything on an ultra, just cram it down your face, get some calories in. If you can stomach it, then it's it's fine. And then it's um, more questioning as you get older. Actually, should I just be shoving anything in in, in my body? It, 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 am I on the money, Dean? There, so much so. I, you know, I go back and look at the book, and in fact, I think I put a food log at the back, and it's just repulsive. <laughs> It's just, you know, I just thought sheer calories, just get in as many calories as you can, and, you know, kind of fuel the engine with with junk. Uh, and that has changed dramatically. And maybe it's a function of age. You know, maybe it's a function of the the sophistication of the sport. You know, the sport has really grown up. Uh, when I first got into it back in the early 90s, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I, I didn't even know what a training block was. Um, you know, I was I was surfing as much as I was running. I didn't take it seriously. And, I, you know, now nowadays it's much more refined. So I think that uh, we've all uh, evolved. And uh, to your point, uh, you know, I'm more interested now in longevity and, you mm -hmm. know, and showing up. And to me, that means optimizing everything that I do to be the best animal I can. And certainly putting that kind of junk food in my mouth is is not going to help me. Have you... Um... Have you struggled at all with sort of diet or alcohol or, or I, I know in, I think in your book, you stopped drinking from a young age. Was that right? But yeah, I mean, after that drunken foray on my 30th birthday, um, you know, I, I said, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I said, you know, do you want to turn 50 and be, you know, bald and, and overweight and, you know, and, and miserable or <laughs> do you want to choose a, a different path through life? And I chose that different path. And so I really, I cleaned up my diet uh, tremendously. And like, like you, because I mean, you're a serviceman and an athlete, we're very disciplined. So I pretty much just wrote a list of acceptable foods and unacceptable foods. And, you know, the acceptable foods were, uh, you know, all the things that are kind of in vogue eating now, which is mainly uh, plants and, and things that grow uh, and you can pick from a tree or dig from the earth or catch with your hands. And I just eliminated all junk food. I just said, do, you know, just there's no such thing as a cheat day in my life. It's just it's black and white. You know, you just do not eat these things you used to eat. Dean, what would you my, my issue is I snack in the evening. So I think it's probably like a, 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 a comfort habit thing to get rid of the stress of the day. It, it, it was alcohol for 30 30 years plus plus all the other stuff so i i've kind of refined it down but what i'm often thinking i mean scott jurek he's really into diet isn't he and he i i would imagine he could just knock up a snack and it's going to be <laughs> very healthy um what do you do yeah i, I uh you know i snack primarily on fruit um, most of my carbohydrates come from fruit. So uh, I'm pretty picky about my fruit. You know, I, I buy organic. It's yeah, it's more expensive, but it's what I'm putting in my body. So I, you know, I choose <laughs> to, to do what I do. And the, you know, my go to is an apple uh, or, an, or a pear or something like that. I don't, 
I don't really eat, you know, like, I mean, Scott uh, is, <clears throat> he's, he's very, um, he's, he's more into like, I'm more of a kind of a raw diet person. So I just, I don't refine my food where, you know, he eats vegan, but it's, it's a lot of it is, is, you know, processed in a food processor or kind of made in a certain way. You know, I don't, I don't drink smoothies anymore. I just would rather eat the raw fruit. Uh, so that's kind of my, my snacks. And, you know, the other thing is that, uh, you know, I, I see that when I used to snack, it was usually, you know, when I was reading the paper or watching a program or something like that. So I tried to turn off the stimulus and, you know, now I, um, I kind of de decouple the two. So I'm going to have a snack. I'm just going to sit there and eat the snack and it's going to be independent of reading the paper or reading a book or whatever. Oh, wow. I'm going to try that. We're really bad in this family because we, <laughs> we like to eat in front of the tv it's um yeah these dilemmas when you're a parent i mean <laughs> who oh, would ever want to be one it is tough and mm. i'll tell you what um you know the the kids are so quick to to spot her hypocrisy right if you say hey don't eat in front of the television and then you do it <laughs> your credibility goes right out the window so uh you know the one thing we did when my kids were younger is you know we just had Uh, family dinner. It was kind of a tradition where we just said, no screens, you know, no phones, nothing. We're going to have fun. We're going to make a really good dinner and we're all going to sit together and eat it. And, and then we're going to do the dishes and then we can all go our, our separate ways and get back in your screens or whatever. You know, that's why I've been really, one of the things I've been cross about with all this lockdown is it, expecting people to work from home that, you know, So my, my girlfriend, she works with youngsters with drug, drug issues. So it's quite serious stuff. And there's a lot of, as you, I'm sure everyone listening can imagine, there's a lot of nasty stuff that goes on in that area in historically for these youngsters. And, um, you know, she's had to bring that into our home now and, and work from our food table, you know, our dining table with our little one running around and we just ignored the school and we just we you know we we're both in professions where we just sent him to school still but these parents that had to homeschool i mean i think you homeschool anyway dean didn't don't don't didn't you We did for periods, yes, uh, and we traveled with my kids. So <clears throat> my my mom was a retired school teacher, mm -hmm. so she came along with us, and uh, she would um, road school them, as they used to say. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was just, a, you know, our dining table is still, even though my girlfriend's gone back to work now, half of her work stuff is, you know, it's kind of like. Um, Uh, it, 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 it's a bit of you stays behind, you know, she'll, she'll now take half days off and say, oh, I'll just work from home now. So we, we still haven't got our dining table, um, dining table back. What yeah, time? It's a, it's a, it's a tough period of history to be living through, isn't it? Um, for all of us. And, you know, on the, you know, on the back end of this thing, <laughs> the, you know, there's going to be a lot of issues still to work through. And, you know, your, your wife uh, or anyone is, you know, having to uh, bring their work home. And yeah, I say bring their work home. But if you work from home, as, as you know, your work is kind of there 24 hours a day. And uh, especially in a vocation like hers, where you, it, it's hard just to flip the switch off. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these stories, I'm sure, are so personal that it's, it's hard not to internalize those things. Yes, I hate to think of the. I mean, domestic violence must have, I mean, people are just not used to being on top of each <laughs> work as you break from your, your partner. And uh, um, yes, I think uh, we don't even know what's in store for us, do we? Well, I think, you know, on the, on the flip side, um, more people have discovered the outdoors because of the pandemic. And so at least here where I live in California, uh, you know, trails where I used to, see one or two you know people uh, a day when i was running on them now are like filled with people mm -hmm. and i think that's a really healthy thing i think that when you get outdoors you know you appreciate the environment more and you're more environmentally conscious as a result i think that um it's healthy <laughs>
you know, the, I don't know if you've been tracking on the rise of the, the quote unquote, the metaverse, but uh, personally, I prefer the, the real verse. Like, yeah. you know, I, I had this guy telling me, yeah, I mean, look at look, the trees look so real in the metaverse and listen to those birds. They almost sound like real birds. <laughs> like, buddy, just, just walk outside and listen to the real birds. You don't need to put on a headset and be in the metaverse. So I think spending too much time, uh, you know, in, in this digital world is not so healthy. No, it's also, I mean, in California, when you're out running and someone runs the other way, do, do you say hello to each other? Most people do, or at least nod or acknowledge. Mm. That's had a real effect in the UK, I think. Um, I, I think everyone's just, the, the whole way society's been has made everyone so self-conscious that people will run down with their head down and, everyone on their way to work they're just staring at the screen and you run by and it it almost makes me quite cross dean it, 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 this is our you know this is our children's lives that we're just destroying um yes <laughs> sorry going on yeah no, i mean we're two old farts talking about the problems of the world but you know i guess uh you, you know as you age your your perspective on uh, uh you know your worldview changes as well and there's certainly um you know a lot of things culturally we could talk about that are not going right um you know both in the uk and here in the us but you know one thing that we've really got wrong here that rarely gets discussed is that um we're we're the most age segregated uh country on earth and to me, that's really unhealthy. Uh, I'm, I'm Greek. And when I go back to Greece, you know, you see uh, multi-generations of families living together or at least nearby. And, you know, on the weekends when you go to a park, there's kids running around, you know, the, the, there's their parents, there's teenagers, uh, there's, you know, the grandparents, it's, it's ages, uh, you know, it's the whole generation. And it just has a, I think that's good for everyone. Uh, it's good for the young people and for the old people. So that's one thing in America that is, to me, is really very unhealthy, is that it, we're so segregated when it comes to putting people together uh, of different ages. There's a lot of talk about, you know, being more racially uh, uh, non-segregated, but as far as age, that still is a topic I, I you don't hear a lot about. And I think that's going to become uh, more and more uh, a, a topic of conversation moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. Um, have you had the frappe coffee in Greece? <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> oh, really? I like the little black Greek, traditional Greek coffee. It's like a really strong espresso. Yeah. Yeah. I drove to India once from uh, Norway. I drove a bus to India and back. And <laughs> All right. We got to unpack that one a little bit, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, uh, we were doing volunteer. Well, we were volunteers. We, um, I'd just been working in Africa with street children and this organization asked me if I would drive a, a bus of journalists to India and back so we could uh, write articles about people living in poverty, communities in poverty. Um, when we got to Greece, we all became addicted to these frappe, <laughs> frappe <laughs> coffees. And then I found out it's, it's only Nescafe spooned into this shaker and you, you froth it up. But one night we parked at the Acropolis and so we all grabbed our sleeping bags and we all went and slept on the, on the, there's like a bit of a Rocky mountain sort of thing going on there, isn't there? Mm. We all slept out on the rocks one night and in the morning when we woke up, we were these little snakes <laughs> all around us that had come out on the rocks to, um, <laughs> to, to warm up. You what spent, year was that? I'm just cu I'm curious. Uh, that was, um, the millennium, uh, might've been 2001. Mm. Yeah. Do you, you, you spent quite a bit of time there. Yeah, I do. I, um, I, I really love Greece and, you know, mm. it's, it's kind of like, I, I didn't discover Greece until a little bit later in life, even though I'm a hundred percent Greek, uh, generationally, you know, my, my grandfather came over to America in, you know, the early 1900s and, you know, they, they thought of Greece as a poor country, you know, the, they, they wanted to get out of Greece. And every time, you know, I'd say, I want to go back to Greece. They'd say, why, why do you want to go there? It's, it's dirty and everyone's poor. And so I had this kind of 
tainted view. And then when I went and experienced Greece myself, I thought, wow, it's a, it's a beautiful place. And it's, it's, it's not these things that they described at all. So uh, once I, I, you know, started going to Greece, it just, now, now it's all I want to do. And the running there is phenomenal. And, you know, it's just, it's kind of undiscovered. It's like the, the best known secret in running, you know, R Greece is the birthplace of long distance running but you go around on these trails and you, you don't see anyone. Yes. Um, the, the, the crazy drivers there, Dean, though, hey? <laughs> Jeez, never seen anything like I was hitchhiking there and I got picked up by, a, I think it's an 80-year-old man and he was, he was driving like in Formula One or something. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's juxtaposed because most Greeks are pretty mellow. But you put them behind the the steering wheel. <laughs> it's like a different different personality comes out. And yeah, the first time I ran there in Athens, it was you know I I was running on the sidewalk and uh, I I saw a red light ahead of me and I thought oh that's fine you know I'll just stop. And all the uh, the motorcyclists to get around the red light just drive up onto the sidewalk. <laughs> and all of a sudden I see fifteen motorcycles you know tearing my way. So. Mm -hmm. I've gotten used to the Greek driving. Do you prefer running in the heat? I do. I mean, I've, I've run uh, across Death Valley in the middle of summer, which is the hottest place on earth. And I've also run a marathon to the South Pole, which is the coldest place. And to me, I'll take the heat any day. Yes, I'm, I'm a bit the same. Um, that, so that's bad water, right? Bad, yeah, the Badwater yeah. Ultramarathon. Mm -hmm. See, we, in the UK, we hear all these names and we can only aspire to sort of being there one day. Um, did you... it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place worth experiencing, even if you don't do the race, just because it's, it's, so, it's so much, it's, it's so otherworldly. You know, you, you just, it's like being on Earth, but not on earth it's almost like you're on mars it's um it's the the heat is just it it's hard to describe you know the way it just warps warps your perception warps time just changes everything it just it just owns you in a way that you 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 know you you're you're so in tune to the environment because you have to be dean is it true that you run on the white line so you don't melt your running shoes <laughs> It is absolutely true. I've had my running shoes uh, melt at Badwater, and uh, the the white line stays cooler than the black tarmac. Yeah, you you've won it, won it, haven't you? Well, I don't say I won. I say I I survived the fastest. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, yeah, that's pretty humble of you. It's it's they don't call it the world's toughest foot race for nothing. <laughs> you know yeah. that it, it it has changed a bit. Um, you know, when I, I've done it 10 times and uh, it, it was always uh, running through Death Valley in the middle of the heat of the day because it started in the morning. Uh, but the uh, National Park Service, where the race is held, they, uh, they don't allow races when the temperature gets above 120 degrees. And it's almost always above 120 degrees at Badwater. So now the race starts at night. So you're running through the kind of the toughest section at night. So it's kind of changed the, the dynamic just a bit. Mm. How long does it take you to finish? Is it 120 miles? 135. 135. Yeah, it was um, around 27 hours. That's insane. And for the Western States, what's your fastest time there? Because you, you've won that, that one as well, haven't you? No, I've never won that one. I've, I've finished in the top 10, I think five or six times. And I've run that in uh, just over 17 hours. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> that's incredible. Cause the sort of Holy grail for a hundred miler, they say is 24 hours. Don't they? It's, it's the, that's what, if you can get under that, you're really doing well, but to think yeah, and at, at the Western States, uh, about 25% of the field finishes in, in sub 24 hours. Yeah. And you get a, a, a different buckle, uh, you know, you get a belt buckle prize. So you get a different one, a silver buckle. If you finish 
in under 24 hours and a bronze buckle if you finish under 30 hours, which is the, the cutoff is 30 hours. Did you get into it this year? Did you get uh, a you place? Know, I, no, I, I got to be honest. I, you know, I've done it um, 13 times and it's so hard to get into the Western states nowadays. It's the, the odds of getting accepted to Western states are lower than getting into Harvard. <laughs> it, it's, in, it's something like 13,000 to one. And I kind of felt guilty that I was putting my name in the hat because I thought, you know, you've experienced it so many times. It's, it, you know, let, let someone else have their turn at it. So I, uh, you know, I'm going to go and support the race like I, I have the last couple of years and potentially pay someone. So help them get to the finish line. But uh, I think when I turn 60, I'm going to do it again, just because it's kind of a milestone. But until then, I'm just going to kind of, you know, let others uh, experience the magic of Western states. Mm. It's, it's one hell of a race. And the, what with YouTube, there's quite a lot about it on the internet now. Um, yes. What, uh, when, when you wrote about it in a runner's high, it really seemed like it was hard getting hard work for you it, it, it is that has that become a thing or was this a one-off or you know it's um it, the the thing that's become is that um when i have a bad race there there it's it's bad <laughs> you know in younger years when i was having a bad race i just kind of put my head down and grunt through it and still do half well um, you know, as I said, with the Western states, uh, you, you know, I, I went from hoping to, to break the age record to just hoping to finish. So, um, you know, things went bad and it, yeah, it took a lot out of me. I had to dig really, really deep uh, to reach the finish line. But in a way, you know, I chose to write about the Western states in my most recent book because it wasn't a good race. I think a, a, a tough race makes a better story than a good race. So mm. that's one of the reasons I chose that particular uh, uh, event to write about. Do you, would you say you've significantly, significantly lost, I don't know what we're going to call this, strength and, or conditioning as you got older? Because I'm 52 now and I honestly feel fitter than I've ever, ever been. But then again, I was never a competitive runner when I was young like, like you were. Well, I think the uh, the subtitle of my book kind of states it, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, you know, older, wiser, slower, stronger. Yes. So I agree with you. I think I have better endurance, but uh, what has gone, you know, out the window is my, my leg speed. I have to work twice as hard, you know, to keep up the same pace that used to come easy to me. So I've really noticed my speed is, is what's compromised as I've gotten older but not so much my strength or my endurance. Hmm. Do you think this sport's changed since you started, since you started out? Oh, very much so. Uh, you know, like I said, in, uh, in the early nineties, when I got into it there, you know, there weren't a lot of trainers around. Uh, there wasn't any information on the, on the quote of internet, you know, you could do research. So you just kind of threw yourself into these things and, and kind of learned as, as an experiment of one. And now everything is so quantified. I mean, you know, people train and I mean, I, I know people when they run, I mean, it's their, their, their run on a daily basis has got to be about something. They can't just <laughs> run for the joy of running and they've got to, you know, uh, stay on their, on their schedule on what their, you know, their coaches or their trainers outlined, you know, we're obviously tracking every micro step we take. Uh, every breath we take, every heartbeat, <laughs> the rhythms between our heartbeats. Mm. So it's, it's changed so much. And, you know, the level of um, competition has increased incredibly as well. Uh, you know, there are decorated collegiate athletes and, you know, Olympic qualifiers that are running ultra marathons and, you know, they're, they're crushing it. So it, it really has changed a lot. I think one of the most interesting dynamics is, the, the new records that are being set, they're incremental gains on old records. So they're not just smashing old records. And I think it speaks a lot about the, um, the resilience and the toughness of racers of bygone days, that for them to be able to run those times now that are, 
you know, are being surpassed, but not, not remarkably surpassed. I think that speaks a lot to, you know, how runners have maybe softened up a bit over the years. Yes. There's I, one thing that sort of, I wouldn't say it, bug, it doesn't bug me, but when I wrote, um, uh, where is it? So I wrote my runner's book. There you go. We have something in common. S- state of mind. And um, I think I open it by saying, if, you're, if you want to find a book about calories and hill sprints and laps and this isn't the book. <laughs> this is not the book for you. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I've completely forgotten. Oh, yeah. It, 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 I try to get across to people that the, the elitism in sports like this doesn't, it, it's, it puts so many people off from wanting to give it a go. You know, if you watch the, the UK media, you'd think that running a half marathon was like the hardest thing <laughs> in the world. It's only for the privileged elite. You know, you got to have the gym. And I'm like, oh, come on, why are you saying this stuff? It's just to put an old pair of trainers on. Doesn't, you know, don't have to be good. I don't even carry one of these water bottles that everyone seems to not on, certainly not on a short, you know, a short, like a half marathon distance or something. And, um, and I, I don't know how, do, do, do you get that in America, this sort of elitism that people who run ultras want to be held in this kind of esteem? I don't, I don't get that vibe so much. I am, um, you know, I, uh, I'm a columnist for a magazine called ultra running magazine. And it's, you know, kind of a leading voice of the sport. And, you know, one thing I love about the magazine is it's still funky. <laughs> you know, it's not super ripped people, you know, with their shirts off, uh, you know, in record breaking times. You know, there are pictures of uh, people with body types you'd never suspect to be running a, an ultra marathon and they're smiling. They're, you know, they're a picture of people running with their dogs. So the magazine has tried to keep ultramarathoning uh, approachable. And, and that's one thing I really advocate is to get away from what you just described. I think that it can be off-putting and intimidating for people. Running itself is in, intimidating enough, um, let alone, you know, having the media saying, wow, it's, it's, this is, you know, is only for the, the most elite of the elite. So, you know, one thing I also advocate for is um, longer cutoff times in these races. Any race I'm involved with, I have really uh, liberal cutoff times because some of these race, these races, uh, like the Western States for someone, you know, they're so intimidated by the idea. Like I, I would never be able to run 30, you know, 100 miles in under 30 hours. I'm not going to enter because I'll never be able to finish in that long. So I say, you know, for these 100 mile races, let's have a 48 hour, let's have a two day cutoff. So people that think I can never do it can get into it and actually have a go at it. Uh, so that's one thing that I, you know, I, I promote and I hope you do the same. Yes. I can remember when I was about 35, Dean, and I had somebody then trying to talk me out of running. They were saying, you're too old. You're going to hurt yourself. You're too, <laughs> you're too old. One thing I've, uh, that I don't do anymore. I don't have any Strava or or any app app on my 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 phone anymore. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I was I think I was when I was running two hundred mi- miles. For, I, I did I gave up last Christmas. Not this one, just gone, but the one before to run two hundred miles around a running track for Christmas and. And uh, I remember people were messaging me, goes, Chris, what's your Strava? What's your Strava? And I, I just thought, like, I don't want to share that with you. You know, I'm not, I'm not hiding anything. It's just running's a personal thing for me. It's not, it's not. And now I just think when you, when, when your mind is on that thing, it's not, you're not being as spiritual as you, you can be. And I, I, I just love to love running. 
I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I always say to people, you know, running is, is worthwhile in, in itself. Uh, just the act of running and, you know, and viewing running to me as, as play. It's, you know, it's, a, it's adult play. I, I like to go play on a trail and yeah, I'm a, you know, I'm in my fifties, but uh, it's rejuvenating and it keeps me young. So, uh, you know, once in a while I'll quantify a workout and very, very infrequently I'll share it. And I get the same thing like, Oh, you know what, tell me what's your, what's your Strava address and this and that. And I, I just say, you know, I just, I, I don't even, I, I don't have a public Strava. Like I just, I don't, want to get into that rabbit hole because it takes away the joy of running just as you said yes and do you listen to music dean when you run i don't i um half the time i listen to audiobooks so mm. sometimes when i do what are called um lsd training so long slow distance uh, i'll listen to an audiobook because you know when you're training for six or eight hours <laughs> a day sometimes you don't have that much time to read and I love to read. So I think I have more than uh, 500 books on my um, audiobook playlist now. And I listen to maybe three or four books a month. Yeah. I like listen, uh, listening to running audio books when I'm running. Is that maybe I'm a glutton for punishment? No, I, I, I enjoy that as well. In fact, uh, I mean, because you're UK based, I can say this. I was, not too, um, not too happy with the narrator of my of my most recent book, A Runner's High, in in the U.S. And I was going to do the narration myself, but it was right in the midst of COVID, so all the recording studios were shut down. And the uh, the guy who read my book is a professional narrator, and he had a record you know recording studio at his house, so he read it. I, I he just didn't get the connotations right, and we don't speak, uh, you know, the the same way. But the gentleman who read the UK version, I think, did a really nice job. So uh, A Runner's High is available on uh, audiobook in the UK, and I really like the way he read it. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah. Mm. I've still got to do all my audiobooks. I just keep putting it off. I'm just going to do it on – I've got a few microphones, but um, it seems to be what a really popular thing now. It's they're tough to record. I, I've recorded a couple of my books and it's <laughs> it's like an ultra marathon. It just goes on forever. Yeah, but I, I do. I very much enjoy listening to um, like adventure stories when I'm running, you know, like Into Thin Air and um, The Worst Journey in the World, you know, and Shackleton. And they just seem to resonate really well when you're running. Yeah, I think we've got similar taste. Uh, well, we've both been in Antarctica. I went on an ex one of these expedition ships down there and um, scuba dived. Um, had I had I in, in hindsight, I would have asked them if they could set me up for a marathon like, like yourself, <laughs> but uh, I was too engrossed in the scuba diving at the time. So yeah, I've, uh, I've been to the exterior as well, like uh, uh, which you just just described. And it's very different than going to the South Pole. So the interior of Antarctica is a very different experience than uh, the coastline. Yes, I bet. I mean, it's, it's a fascinating continent. I never believed I, I would have had such a wonderful experience down there. I thought it was going to be barren and boring and a few penguins. And, oh, my God, how, how wrong was I? I, I, I agree with you. It's an amazing place. I'm so happy to visit a couple of times. I, I look forward to going back as well. And Dean, probably get fed up with being asked this, but what's, what's next for you? <laughs> well, I'm planning a, a, a big adventure that's been pushed back because of COVID. But um, I'll, I'll tell you, it involves two, uh, two places on earth that uh, are uh, the most extreme and it's the, I don't want to tell you what, what it is because I don't like saying what I'm going to do next until I've actually done it. I'd rather talk about what I just did than what I'm going to do, but it's going to involve about uh, 5,000 miles uh, of running and also um, paddling across a, a bit of ocean, about 800 miles of ocean to complete this trek. And it, um, it hopefully was going to happen uh, at the beginning of uh, 2023. I wish you luck with that. It sounds um, 
Yeah, <laughs> it's it sounds right. hairy. Yeah, no, I think uh, I'd love to have you crew for me because I think you just love everything about this. Yeah. Yeah, well, feel free to invite me. I, I don't know <laughs> if they'll let me travel because I haven't I haven't gone along with any of this stuff, but we'll 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 see. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, it, traveling these days, we could spend a whole podcast about that. But um, I, I've had all this stuff more than I ever wanted to, but I did just because they don't let you board an airplane for an international flight unless you show mm-hmm. them all the proofs of all the needle sticks you've got, all your jabs. And that was the main reason I did it, just because I want to I want to be able to travel. Yeah. But um, one final question for you, Dean. Um, do you, I was going to say, do you run every day? But what I really mean is... It, do you still sort of hop out of bed looking forward to going for a run? I'm still pretty self-motivated. Yeah, I am. I, um, I, I, I don't run every day. I probably run five or six days a week, but I never run the same route twice. And I, you know, I'm, I'm blessed where I live because I have access to great um, open spaces right out my front door. So I can run on a different trail every day and I can run, three or 400 miles on these trails, literally uh, all the way up to Seattle from my house in Northern California. So I still look forward to it. It, It's still, I look forward to it more now uh, than I did pre COVID because now it's kind of like, I need it. (laughs) I really need it. Yes. Yes. It's um, do you, you mentioned one thing in your book, the, the post ultra come down. Is that a big, has that been a big thing for you or? I think, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I've never been analyzed by a psychologist, but I think that uh, I definitely uh, suffer from some level of depression. And, uh, you know, I think it's more, you know, I question things so much. I'm an existentialist, Uh, you know, I'm Greek. So I kind of sometimes, you know, question the meaning of existence. And, you know, you'll, if you ponder that question for too long, it's always going to leave you in a kind of a, (laughs) a quandary uh, psychologically. So I think that that's one of the reasons I run. I mean, my wife always says, why do you even think about these things? Like, don't think about it. You'll be happier. (laughs) And I agree with her, but I just can't stop it. Yeah. Uh, it's not a bad thing to be a thinker. Probably better than being a non-thinker. Yeah, I, I, I don't. There's, I don't know. My mm-hmm. wife and I are very different. I think, uh, uh, you know, she's not. She's a dentist, so she's learned. But I mean, I think, uh, you know, her take of, you know, I- ignorance is bliss. There's something to be said about that. I mean, she doesn't watch the news, and you know, I come in steaming like, oh God, this is happening and this is happening. She's like, why do you even watch that stuff? <laughs> I think there's something to be said about it. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't watched the news for, for 20, 20 years now and uh, can't say, I can't say I miss it. So Dean, listen, uh, you, you're a busy man. I'm, I'm humbled that you've come on my show. Um, I have to massively thank you again for uh, what you've added to my life um, or what your example tr- triggered off for me um i'd encourage anybody watching get into running you know when i trained for the london marathon i think i ran a quarter of a mile around the block that was all i could do quarter of a mile and a week later you're running a mile and then before you know it you you you're clocking up some distances and it's it's just an incredible sport so thank you for your book dean that was um, really kind of you and wonderful read, folks. As I say, I'll put a link for Dean's books below. So please go and grab one. And um, Dean, stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But massive thank you again. And uh, I hope we can chat again at some point in the future. I think uh, I hope we can share some footsteps together at some point in the future. Oh, would, the, yeah, that would be. I would yeah. enjoy that much more. Yeah. Yeah, that would be magnificent. Thank you. And to our friends at home, massive love to you all. Please look after yourselves. If you can like and subscribe, 
Hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Thank you. 